Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest in the IMAP webinar series. This week, we've got a fascinating uh, set of views on um, what it takes to make a success of establishing a managed account program and the dynamics of uh, establishing that program uh, and making it broadly accepted both across a client base and, and an advisor base. We're going to be talking about the issues around uh, successful establishment of managed account programs in three, in three ways. Firstly, today, we're going to be talking about the fundamental issues in, in thinking about a managed account program for an advice business. On Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the administration and operation and how they underpin success and, and growth in a, in a managed account program. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking about the investment issues. Um, we're lucky today, this week to have been joined by Jamie Johns, um, who, after 20 years or so in financial services, involved in, in advice and in working with and helping develop uh, advisors, most recently as, as general manager of, of Madison's uh, financial group, and now as a very successful consultant in working with advisors, is also a non-executive director of Mason Stevens, an MDA provider, which as many of you will know, is currently in the process of, of going through an IPO uh, process. Um, it's uh, it's um, you know, common for me to put up this slide. And of course, we'd encourage you um, in talking with our uh, to uh, in, in listening to our two uh, panelists today and, and listening to, to Jamie um, to have questions, please feel free to to ask those as we as we go. Um, before I hand over to Jamie, just uh, let me talk um, a little more about about upcoming events for IMAP. As I say, this week we'll be focusing on um, the the di the dimensions of establishing a a managed account program, um, and then next year we have a a really um, uh, exciting and, and, and comprehensive um, set of events, Portfolio Management Conference in Melbourne and Sydney, Advice in Action, which, are, which gives us a chance to focus on the dynamics of running an advice business um, uh, in July, uh, and of course, the Managed Account Awards, which will kick off in April for awards in, in August. So now it's my pleasure to hand over to Jamie Johns to, to introduce today's uh, presenters um, and to, to take us away on the issues of establishing a successful managed account program. Jamie, thanks very much. Thanks, Toby. So as Toby alluded to, today is really about the fundamentals of managed accounts. So what we're going to do is start by looking at what the principles are around managed accounts, how they've evolved and historically how we've got to where we are now. We're going to look at the role of investment solutions and what that plays within the advice process, how you look at considering uh, a managed account, how that's built, whether you're taking one off the shelf or looking at evolving your own set of managed accounts in your business, the benefits of concentrated portfolios um, and how they deliver low cost and more transparency, and what some of the minimum transaction sizes are to ensure that your clients uh, are looking and chasing alpha without a delayed implementation in what we've seen in how portfolios have been managed historically. We'll then have some uh, additional questions uh, with both of our speakers today, and then we'll open up for some uh, questions from the audience. But today we're joined by two very experienced professionals in the managed account space. First, we've got Brett Sanders, who's a chief executive at Philo Capital. And then we'll be joined by Will Riggle, who's the chief investment officer, uh, formerly known as Rolton, which is now owned within the Climb Group. So let's just, rem just a reminder, as Toby mentioned, uh, any questions along the way, please make sure that you use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, in order to send those through. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Brett so that he can kick off giving us some context and uh, historical background as to where we are now. Thanks, Brett. Good on you. Thank you, Jamie, and good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, look, what I wanted to do to, to cover today is a few things. Firstly, to remind ourselves around the benefits that managed accounts offer. You know, what's the promise? Why would we want to do this? Uh, then to talk a little about the roles of parties in a managed account and SMAs and MBAs, the, 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 how those roles are both similar and, and different. Um, talk a little bit about the history, as Jamie alluded to there, uh, what brought us to this point. Uh, but more importantly, you know, what are managed accounts, how are they going to evolve into the future and what, you know, why is that important if you're making decisions about managed accounts today and what sort of program you established. And finally, I'll give you a little case study, a very quick one on a practice that's there, where their managed account program has evolved over time and, and the dynamics of that. And you know, hopefully there's some interesting you know, food for thought there. So to kick off, the benefits for investors, of course, faster rebalancing. And that means that, you know, um, that investment decisions are translated into action more quickly. Um, we see in traditional ways of rebalancing portfolios can take anything from, you know, four or five weeks, sometimes out to a year to roll through changes to portfolios. If you can do it more quickly, obviously that has performance implications for investors. We've got some very interesting research on that. Anybody who's interested, pop your details uh, in the chat or, um, you know, email them through and, and we'll get that research to you. Um, but other benefits for investors, more equitable, the comfort of knowing you're being treated fairly, easier to own, you don't have to sign um, permission to make changes all the time. For licensees, less advice risk, of course, your centralised portfolio management, apply more expertise to it, a little bit more process and rigour, that's a good thing for the quality of the business and for investment outcomes. Uh, and there's a potential revenue stream there for licensees as well. Though not everybody chooses to go down that path, but that's something if you're a licensee that you can certainly think about. For an advice practice, um, efficiency, um, the removal of so many SOAs and ROAs from a business, um, that that's, speaks volumes for efficiency. In our experience also translates to happier clients having a, a managed account program. Um, and one, an issue that doesn't get talked about enough is the removal of conflict. So when you're looking at rebalancing portfolios in a traditional way, it's always that decision as to, okay, well, am I going to, you know, make this investment decision to make a change? Um, and for many practices, rolling a change through a client base can cost ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in staff time, depending on the size of the practice. So on the one hand, will I do this and, and spend ten or twenty thousand dollars? On the other hand, if I do nothing, it costs me nothing. That's a major conflict. I think it's very hard to comply with the industry code of ethics under the old way of operating. A managed account, whether it's an SMA or an MDA, makes that issue go away. Um, it's, it's purely about investment merit because the, the marginal cost of acting or not acting is about the same. For advisors, less work, um, better support in terms of investment discussion. You get a flow of information from a portfolio manager that, that keeps you up to date and informed and ready to have those important investment discussions with your clients. And in our experience, more referrals too, because um, people enjoy the experience and they do tell their friends. Um, okay, so there's some of the benefits for the different stakeholders involved. In terms of SMA and MDA, you can see there's a slide there on the screen um, and a lot of similarities between these two. So just talking broadly, you have a portfolio manager making investment decisions, someone uh, like Klein perhaps. Uh, you have a platform that is uh, holding assets in custody, implementing trades, providing reporting, doing you know your public office, superannuation administration, all those great things that platforms do. And then down the bottom, in that bottom segment, you've got the issuer of a service. And for an SMA, which is a PDS-based product, a registered scheme, the issuer is called a responsible entity. In the MDA world, the issuer is called an MDA provider, in this case, Philo. Um, now, in both cases, the issuer is responsible to the regulator for the compliance of the service or the scheme. Um, in the case of an MDA provider, we think MDA providers tend to do a little bit more on top. So 
um, helping design services, the the operations of a of a of a an MDA program, uh, and sort of an ongoing consulting role. And we can I'll show you how that manifests a little bit later on. But a lot of similarities here, but because of the different structures, one having a PDS, one not having a PDS, uh, there's a little bit more flexibility in our opinion around that MDA structure. Um, now, what um, uh, in terms of just talking about the history for a little bit, maybe we'll just we can take that one down, Toby. But the, talking about the history, managed accounts um, really started. Um, I don't need that slide either. It's for the moment, thanks. But managed accounts really started as a um, it started in the broking community, a discretionary service where a broker could make you know do trades on behalf of their clients under discretion. So very much Australian shares focused. Um, over time, we saw, uh, and, and that you know, made broking a more efficient um, activity and so had quite an impact on, on that market. It, Australian equity-based SMAs are really a replacement for a managed fund, for an Australian equity managed fund. And so they didn't really bring a lot of efficiency to a practice because a managed fund was already efficient. But what it did bring was transparency and tax benefits because you don't have a unit price, therefore you're not buying into a price that's got embedded gains, unrealized gains in it. You, you know, you, if each investor has their own account-based um, experience through that SMA and they have their own cost base for the assets. And so more tax efficiency, efficiency and, and more transparency. Then we saw the industry evolve into multi-asset class SMAs and MDAs, and this is where the industry really started to kick off. I guess most of that was sort of happening around 2007 through to 2013, where it sort of got some momentum and then and then kicked on uh, even more strongly from there. Um, so um, the, the growth has come when managed accounts started offering more in terms of practice efficiency. That, that's been one of the, the big drivers. And of course, having these managed accounts on platform. Where do we think that evolution is going in the future? What are the what could you expect to see, not just over the horizon, but there's some things that are, are happening now. Um, first of all, more model choices. So typically um, in the managed account world, you know, you're choosing in the multi-asset class managed accounts between sort of three to five models. Um, that's changing. And so in the MDA world, amongst our client base, we probably have on average a dozen models. And we've got some clients with, you know, more than 20 uh, if they have specific need to do so. Multi-platform, being able to have a single managed account service, but offered over multiple platforms. So one set of documentation and processes, but access through more than one platform. I think that's attractive to people. More customization choices. So today we see things like substitute and exclude assets. Uh, we think there'll be a few more of those sorts of uh, preferences available and with a bit more flexibility about, you know, doing things like allocating beginning and end dates. Um, further, the, the integration of illiquid assets into managed account strategies. Most begin with the presumption today of daily liquid investments. Um, some models, we have some clients that might have uh, assets that are, you know, might be sort of four to six weeks to, to um, process a redemption, um, but not illiquid assets. And yet, you know, many investors increasingly holding private market investments and other assets that they'd like to see integrated into their managed account strategy. I can promise you that that is coming. Uh, and then segment based propositions. So uh, looking at client, your client base as not um, homogenous, but saying, well, there are segments within my client base and those segments might be around demographics. They may be around this, how they want to be served. Um, and that you develop managed account strategies that suit each. Okay, so um, one final thing I wanted to touch on is uh, in this sort of very quick introduction for you is how a service can evolve over time. And um, if we could have a look at that next slide, please, Toby. Um, uh, and this is, a, this is a real world case study of a client of ours started off with five uh, managed account portfolios, uh, multi-asset class portfolios, plus an equity sleeve. 
after a, about 18 months, two years, they decided they weren't really happy with their equity manager, terminated them, appointed a new one, but without having to sell down the portfolios, they just point the new manager at the assets, um, then found they were getting quite a few queries from clients about ethical and sustainability issues in investing and thought they would introduce a couple of ESG models, did that, and it was very popular. So they decided, well, they would add more ESG models. So they went from sort of uh, six portfolios um, to eight, and then ultimately landed on, I think 10 was the, the final number, having both ESG and more traditional approaches to portfolio construction. That happened over a period of about three and a half years, cost them absolutely nothing to make those changes. So the flexibility of the structure to keep evolving with their needs. So, you know, messages from my point of view um, is you, you want the managed account to adapt to you. You shouldn't have to adapt to it. Um, you know, if, if that's happening too much, then maybe it's the wrong program and that you um, definitely want to be able to evolve over time and, and the, ideally you want that to be able to happen quickly and cheaply. And so in making a decision today, you should be thinking about that flexibility that's available to you in the future. I'll stop there and pass back to Jamie. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Brett. We have quite a few questions that will be coming later that relate to some of that information that, that Brett shared. But if there is something additional, just as a reminder, you've got the Q&A button to flick those through to make sure we cover them off before the end of the session. So now we've got some great context around where we've been, some vision around where people have evolved and taken um, the adoption of managed accounts within their business. What we'll do now is hand over to Will to actually see how this solution plays out within an advice process uh, and, and what that looks like from a portfolio construction perspective. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Jamie, and, and great to see you and Brett. Um, I think you you really do articulate really well the benefits there, but also the, the questions that uh, independent advice groups do um, have to ask themselves as they start this journey down managed accounts. Um, so perhaps I've got some slides in here that I think there is a little bit of um, crossover with Brett, which is great. But my, I guess my section is more about just saying the how. How do we go about implementing this? What are the principles that we as client uh, take on to try and deliver those efficiencies? So Toby, if I could get you to uh, just shift along a little bit in the slide deck. Oh, I'm happy to talk to my name. That's fine. That's all right. Oh, 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 here we go. Lovely first slide. Yeah, so look, this this is broadly just a, a, a backdrop of where where this whole industry started. And um, and I guess at every step, there's more and more layers that you can come to. And, and Brett was 100% right. As the evolution came from just your ASX listed securities, which is a key part of um, the investment landscape for Australians. I don't know many people that I've come across that haven't had some engagement with shares along their life. Um, but I guess then at some point in time, as with the, the superannuation funds, the, the attractiveness and the, the opportunities that were available in the international space uh, needed to um, be explored. And so we had the, essentially this is a platform a platform journey, as you do, uh, under the managed accounts banner, ASX listed, then into international and then using that functionality and, and more of an understanding of technology, we were able to incorporate some of the benefits of those managed funds. Um, there's no one solution um, for any advice practice, and we all, and they all start from different points. And and guess my challenge as CIO, and as I get in to talk to some of these groups and try and work out how we can possibly help them or at least help their understanding, is where where do they actually want to get to and what do they want to use. Um, Across the way, um, you know, Brett did indicate that it was the, really the multi-asset approach is you can add in more and more of those asset classes. Uh, a single asset class uh, managed account sleeve, which provided that transparency, that execution benefits, but it wasn't really a way that the practice could change the way they worked, the delivery of efficiency across the group to get those 17, 18 hours that we see quoted by investment trends and, and going up every year. 
Um, I guess where we are now, there's been so much development and investment um, by the partners that that affect in this space. Um, even as ourselves at Climb use some of these, we have our multi-asset models and our single asset models. And within that, um, we do use the model of models approach uh, to allow us to get our own efficiency by um, using our uh, Rolton Australian Equity SMA model within our other multi-assets. Um, and I guess as we move forward and as these um, as groups and as the landscape changes, the private label option is a really interesting approach. How does an advice group uh, essentially align what is quite often an off-the-shelf shelf solution because um, you know, and, and we're seeing more and more uh, options there. Um, but I guess if you're looking to align it with the investment philosophy uh, and the way that you, um, inter I guess, work with your clients to meet their objectives, perhaps a private label managed account is there for you. Um, and that really allows you to branding, price, um, manage, your true mix of managed funds, but also, um, as was alluded to before, um, the emergence of the unlisted space and how you can wrap that uh, in a managed account as well. Um, so I guess that's the so what. So what's the journey for climb along this um, along this stream? And I guess the reality is we see the same thing uh, that the industry sees. There's a real benefit to managed accounts and the adoption uh, and the growth that you see within that um, can't be denied uh, as comes out in every every six months uh, from the IMAP um, surveys. So for Climb itself, its heritage uh, under its founder, John Abernathy, was really that invest Australian equity specialist. And um, I guess it's a way of thinking about it, uh, you're, you as a fund manager. You have an IP, but how do you deliver that? Do you deliver it through the direct discretionary portfolios? Do you deliver it through an ROA process? Um, much like, like the broker scenario. Do you um, actually put them into funds and get the benefits that way? It's, it's this journey of how can you deliver something that is of value. Uh, with Incline, they sort of uh, moved with the industry, added international equities. And then uh, even before the purchase of Madison by Klein, um, they had a number of advisors that came on because there was a need, it's, it's responding to a need for uh, a um, emerging uh, client base that was already using their Australian equity, international equity, and perhaps some unlisted property trusts as well. But we need to understand how do we get the right asset mix to achieve goals. And there was a big shift a couple of years ago that, that Jamie knows only too well, where we, where Madison was brought under the Climb Group. But I guess if we're just talking about managed accounts, it was um, the heritage of um, what are known as the proactive models under uh, the former and actually current chair of the um the Madison IC, uh, James Purvis brought into the group and has, has developed. So there's a multi-asset models already in, in place, available on platform, uh, essentially been around for a long time in the industry. And I guess the shift in strategy um, came to the fore when Rolton and myself came into the business around trying to um, service a, a broader a broader group, a broader industry uh, demand for um, the managed account model. Um, and as we stand today, it's 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 interesting when we talk about it, it's not so much just about a nice off-the-shelf solution, it's about the service. Um, we call them investment solutions really rather than products because even if you choose a managed account, um, that's really half the battle. The other half is trying to get the efficiency by getting the, the uh, clients within your business into those products. And um, you know, I'm sure Brett um, has been doing this for a long term, long time, and would be more than happy to articulate that as well and join that in conversation later. Um, so that's our journey, and I think it continues. Um, uh, when I come to speak now, this every month um, we or I pull together a few insights that happened in the month uh, over the last month about the markets. But I guess overarching that is the philosophy of what are we trying to do here with a managed account? And really it's almost taking a step back uh, as a fund manager and, and there are some egos out in funds management land. And sometimes that is, that's a different philosophy to think that we're just a tool. We are a, a service uh, alongside X plan and other components of the advice process to deliver the efficiencies um, and the goals that are set out there in the first um, component of this process around the dis client discovery period. What do they really want? What do they really need? And using an investment solution 
um, through and with the efficiency and access available through managed accounts um, to deliver that. And then I guess that we're, uh, as we work with some of these closely with some of our advisors, we try and understand whether that investment solution has delivered the objectives. Is it growth? Is it income? Is it um, lower volatility? What, what are they trying to achieve and where are they trying to get to? So more of as an input and a component of the advice process um, and try and support that value as well. Let's jump to the next one, Toby. And so I guess a, a couple of snapshots about how, how we uh, try and deliver those outcomes. And there are many, many ways to deliver this. Um, as we look at our multi-asset models, there are, um, you can have a combination of active, passive, um, daily changes, um, using funds. It, it, there is no one right way, but the, the, for each individual advisor and client, it's about supporting that value proposition. So for us, um, we, um, in Rolton, was an early um, starter within the fund, uh, within the managed account space, and I guess some of those principles were embedded. So um, we we think the delivery of cost and transparency um, to the end client and supporting advisor in that is is best done through a concentrated portfolio. We're just talking about Australian equities now. Um, we roughly have around twenty build a portfolio with around about twenty five stocks, but the minimum starting position is really important. Um, because I guess as we try and implement these portfolios across risk profiles and across different uh, growth objectives, if you have a lower allocation to Australian equities, say 25% in your balance or um, more defensive approach, you still want to have um, this, the, the best ideas relevant in that portfolio. You want to deliver the same outcomes that are on the sheet of paper that you're giving them. So having a minimum, uh, larger minimum position allows um, that 50 basis point minimum within our equity portfolios across all risk profiles and also su supports some of the collateral that comes out. Uh, it's it's valid and available for all clients. Um, and just the next point, it's 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 not so much, not just about the portfolio, portfolio construction that you bring together and your initiation of a position um, and how that can uh, achieve the outcomes just for the next slide, Toby, I'll talk a little bit more about how we go about um, what happens when we actually buy and sell. So, um, and it's very different to the mentality uh, that I started off in my career working for some of the super funds and other corporate uh, larger um, fund, Australian equity fund managers where we're buying 10 basis points or smaller position, iteratively building position. The problem is the platforms just won't accept those trades your client won't uh, be able to see that, get that change in their position if they have a lower lower account balance. So for us, um, the point of actually having a minimum trade size of a percent gives you those dual outcomes. Everyone will be treated the same. There'll be no delays. And that's how we try and get those um, executed. But also, I mean, Brett referred to is a great piece of research done by, by Philo. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll certainly flag it, but we we do talk about it a bit. And someone's done, um, and Philo did a great analysis of the cost of delay. Um, and, and if you understand, if you have to go through the RO process, and certainly that does work and there's no right way, but the delay from insight from our team, we've got a quite a large investment team, if we think there's a great idea, that alpha does get competed away. So quite often by the time it's executed in the portfolio, the price may have run and it actually, what, what I've found from experience is the advisor who, who is impacted by that price of delay and will end up with a client base with a totally different portfolio set. So the ability to manage those clients and the expectations and communicate, it becomes even more complicated. Um, so these are some of the efficiency benefits uh, that come through in that process. So a few touch points from me. Um, a lot of it is in the support of just that transparency piece. Um, and and uh, I guess what's interesting for us is how we can continue to support, you know, advisors who who want to want to communicate that way with clients. Anyway, rambled on a bit, but hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Jamie, you've heard it before. Um, okay. I'm happy to take questions, I guess. We'll hand it back to you, Jamie, and then we'll see where we go. Well, how about we hand back to me and then um, sure. I've just taken a quick squeeze at the questions that we've got so far. Some of those I think we're going to answer 
uh, with some questions I, I want to ask you both. Um, but just, just to both of your points, um, it's very interesting when we talk about the code of ethics and very, very early on, I remember a lot of people challenging how, how managed accounts are used and it conflicting with the code of ethics. But you've both made really strong points around how it actually aligns with the code of ethics um, when you're servicing your clients, especially around who, who would you prioritize in your client base in order to transact? You know, why is one client winning out over another? And the additional risk, but the additional work that's obviously involved in order to uh, manage that change through your whole client base and their portfolio. Um, and to your last point, Will, around the additional work that's then required to supervise those portfolios because you were maybe not able to action uh, that particular trade or change to the whole client base under the same pricing or cost um, analysis. So you therefore got... Um, a different weighting in, across portfolios to who you got to and, and who you didn't at, at what prices. Um, thinking about some of the questions that I can see uh, inside the chat box and also one that I had, we've seen the regulator with uh, licensing, with AFSLs out there, it's a condition to have an MDA on, on, on your AFSL. And quite often the regulator has not been approving uh, these additions or conditions to, to licenses because they require relevant skill and qualification in order for that to be on there. So this question, I guess, is a little bit for you, Brett, because you touched on um, that's a service that, that Philo offer. Um, given that there isn't sometimes significant experience that's out there, and there are a lot of, there's quite a few questions in the chat box that sit around um, for an SMA versus an MDA um, and the requirement. Um, maybe you could cover off some of the questions around when is a PDS required? Is it for both an SM, uh, SMA and an M MDA? Um, and I guess a little bit about the governance around that for anyone who is a little unfamiliar around the governance of an MDA. Sure. sure. Um, look, um, uh, MDAs um, operate under a a legislative instrument, um, 2016 slash 968. Uh, it can be found on the um, ASIC website. It has its own regulatory guide, which is uh, RG179, which is a far more accessible document if people want to understand MDAs. But so, you know, one of the first principles is that, that there is, it's, it's a different um, set of regulation. There is no PDS. You get relief from the PDS provisions of the corporation's law, but the quid pro quo is an MDA can only be sold with personal advice. So whereas theoretically an SMA being a PDS based product, theoretically the investor can read that PDS, be apprised of all the risks and opportunities that, you know, that are available through that product and they can sign an application form. Theoretically, no advice needed. Um, but for an MDA, there must be advice initially, and that advice must be refreshed no less than every 13 months. So that it's the advisor has to form a view that the service is still suitable for their client at least every 13 months. There's a bit of you know misunderstanding and misinformation in the market on that. It's not an opt-in. It's just that the advisor has to think about, okay, is this still suitable for my client? They can issue an ROA. Um, the client doesn't have to sign it. They don't have to opt in again, but that, that advice must be refreshed. So you've got two different regulatory approaches and that immediately has an impact because um, for a client who doesn't want a lot of advice or has a smaller portfolio, for example, you really wouldn't want to be in an MDA because you're having to pay for the annual process of having the advice renewed. So if you've got an investor, a young investor, maybe saving you know fifty thousand dollars towards a house deposit or something, they're an SMA client. They're not an MDA client, in my view. Um, but for larger clients, we think the MDA structure is better because it's got more flexibility. If you read those regulatory guides, there's a lot of different things you can do in there. Very quickly on your point about um, licensing and authorization, yes, you need to be licensed to issue an MDA but you can use a third party MDA provider like Philo 
and there are others at a platform level like Mason Stevens, for example, but you know, there are people who can issue an MDA service for you. So if you don't have it on your own license, you can go to the third party provider and, and have them do that. So that's available um, in the SMA world. Well, you know, there are a plethora of SMAs on platform and you can have SMAs that where the portfolio is designed for you, like a, a, a private label style of SMA, or you can use a standard one that's available off the shelf and there are many choices available. One very quick thing I'd also clarify is you do not need a special authorization on your license to advise on MDA. Once upon a time, sort of 15, 20 years ago, maybe um, not today, uh, as long as you can advise on managed investment schemes, you're good to go. Some great points there, Brett. Um, and I guess one addition I'd just sort of say to that is, yes, there are some great providers out there of the MDA service. And again, you don't need that uh, to advise on for your authorization, but certainly it's a conversation if you don't have your own AFSL for advice, something to raise with your licensee around um, the advice delivery of the MDA service. Now, we've seen, um, and I know I've had significant conversations around the increase of advice firms looking to get their own AFSL. Um, there's no shortage of those considering looking at that. One of the pieces of advice I've given out um, a lot this year is if, if people are looking to take that step uh, and get their own AFSL, maybe not trying to set up your own SMAs doing that concurrently, maybe Cross one, cross one bridge first and get your license established before you undertake the work to, to look at scoping uh, separately managed accounts for your practice. Now, as you mentioned, Brett, there are a lot of institutional um, SMAs that are, that are run out there now, and that comes with a lot of experience um, for those managers that are in there, the same with Will and, and his team. For those who are thinking about running uh, an SMA, there's a lot of considerations from an operational perspective. What pieces of advice would you both give to practices where they're looking to maybe explore what's available on the platforms that they use or they're considering taking that step and, and creating their own? Did you want to start, Will? Yeah, all right. I'll, I'll chime in um, on that one. I guess it's almost almost overwhelming in a way sometimes when you go out to manage accounts. You've got a, the range of platforms. You do have all the options, and then I guess it's almost when you we are given lots of um, lots of new tools. The the, the um, I guess the the risk is that you actually go grab at everything, um, and so and perhaps that's part of the process. Um, that we've been a part of where I think it's really important just to take a step back and, and just have a range of conversations with all the different players, all people who've done it before, because quite often, you know, when we, we perhaps a month or so later and we come back and we're talking again to that advice group, they're much more focused around really what are the key things they want to get out of this. Um, and, um, and as well, it also hones... Um, the conversation within the advice group because um, when you have a, a range of advisors who all all perhaps some like picking stocks, someone wants to use ETF, it's, yeah, there has to be a compromise there somewhere. So within that within that process, I think just just a longer exploration period is really important, and um, and talking to I guess the, the other part is start with what you've got. Um, if you've got a really uh, well uh, communicated investment philosophy and a, and, and a range of assets behind that that's been working for you, there is really no need to change too much. The, the, the functionality that an MDA can provide or even a platform, the ability for the advisor to actually implement 90% of the benefits of an SMA while still perhaps holding that um, unlisted property trust, be it, um, you know, a, a century or is it a Balmain or something along those lines that they've used in the past. It's how do you integrate part of your value solutions, what you've what you've got. So um, uh, what I encourage is to, yeah, just, just have those conversations. The, 
I guess start with a clean sheet of paper on, on what your value really is, what you want to get out of this, but you don't need to start with a clean sheet of paper on, I guess, the asset mix and, and how you've gone about providing those solutions today. And look, I my what, what could I add to that? I, I think um, we've got clients who have chosen, like from a governance point of view, you can set up managed accounts in different ways. So if you have a tailored program, to what extent is the advice firm involved in the investment decision-making process? So some clients choose to have all the investment decisions sort of streamed through their investment committee. You can do that for managed funds. It doesn't tend to work too well for a portfolio of direct stocks uh, because there's just too many things going on too quickly. But, you know, if you want to make an asset allocation change or take a manager out and put another manager in, do you want that to come to your investment committee or do you want to delegate that authority to your investment manager um, and people have, you know, it depends on how they want to represent themselves to their clients. You know, I'm at the table, I'm monitoring this, and I have a right of veto versus, you know, I'd rather save the organisational time and devote it to other things I do for my clients. Practices have different views on those topics, and so you can set up the structure to suit the way that you want to project yourself to your clients and the, the things you want to do. The other thing that happens is people say, okay, well, you know, we typically, we like to run active models, for example, but we wouldn't mind having an index-based set, same asset allocation drivers, but where we've got clients who are more budget conscious that we could offer them an index-based set or an ESG-based set, or we have some clients who will say, you know, I want to be able to offer my clients direct equities if they want them, but I can have a portfolio without direct equities or... I've got retirees who are very sensitive to drawdown. So I've got, again, the same basic asset allocation drivers, but I might construct a portfolio to make it a lower drawdown portfolio as an option for retirees. So these are the things that become available if you've got the right structure in place where you get that flexibility. Um, and again, you know, it suits different segments of a client base. So I would never advocate MDA over SMA exclusively or, you know, I don't think it is a, a binary decision. You know, I think these are structures that suit different clients and different practices and you you pick the tool off the shelf that will do the job for you. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, coming back to the investment competency of who is involved in these decision making and what's the governance around being able to uh, essentially create a funnel for the investment choices and, and staying true to what that investment philosophy is for, for these accounts once they're set up and ongoing governance. Mm -hmm. Now, if we think about the different channels that sit within the advice process and, and who's involved within this, we've probably got three core areas. We have the AFSL or perhaps it's a licensee level, then we have the advisor who's giving the advice and then we have the client who's the end result um, and actually receives the managed account in their portfolio. If we think about those three core areas, what would you say success looks like adopting a managed account philosophy if you're within those, those three channels? Um, well, look, you know, I sort of touched on it a bit earlier, but I think for the, um, you know, talking to the advisor's perspective, I, I, I just so often when I'm talking to advisors, I feel deeply uncomfortable about a lack of equity in the way they're treating their clients. And so success for an advisor to me is them knowing that, um, that all their clients have a similar risk profile are in the same portfolio and when they choose to make a change, everybody gets dealt with at once and without, you know, if it gets truncated and you implement over time, you get that situation that Will mentioned that everybody buys at different prices or it gets to a point where the investment thesis no longer holds. So you stop implementing the change and you repeat that about four times and all of a sudden your client base is all over the place. And so bringing it back where people, there's more uniformity, um, you've still got room to customise using some of those preferences for very client-specific reasons, but you're not getting diversity that have just caused by administration happening over a period of time. So I think success for an advisor is that comfort of going to sleep at night, going, you know what, I'm treating everybody the same. They're all being, doesn't matter if they've got 100,000 with me or a million, 
they're being treated the same and and uh uh and and that you know it's a very timely and, and appropriate service um for the investor um it's it's just you know having an easier to own experience i think managed accounts are easier to own you don't have rois appearing in your inbox all the time and you know please read this and get back to me and some people are quick and some are not quick but it's it's you know a, a, it's a much less stressful in um, relationship and and what what I do find talking to advisors is conversations start to change between advisors and investors and investors like it. So the success for the investor is by all means keep me up to date on how you're managing the money, but let's have more conversations about what I'm going to do with that money and when can I do it? Can I afford to help the kids pay a deposit on a house? Can I afford to have a, a you know a, a better holiday? You know those sort of things. Practically, you know, people feel the benefit of that. The service becomes more relevant to them in a more personal way. So I, I think that's success for them, that there's more time for those conversations. And then at the licensee level, it's, you know, licensees, uh, to some extent, we know it's a tough business to be in. And being able to put their arms around risk and understand what's going on and have much less opportunity for things to go wrong uh, I think that's a, a great thing for licensees. If they choose to have a product as well and take some margin, well, that, that's up to them. Then that's, that introduces a new conflict, but it's not unmanageable. Um, everybody has their own views on what they want to do there. Many of our clients don't go down that path, but but some do. You know, so um, that's uh, success for them. I think though is just as I say, feeling that they can manage their risks a little bit more rather than having to bob on the a cork on the ocean of risk and sort of taking, going where it takes them, you know, having a little bit more sense of control. And, and I think that's something they enjoy. Great. Thank you, Brad. Will, um, anything, I guess, to, to add to um, those three core areas? And I guess you are uh, within a company that does have uh, advice within um, the group holding and having advisors using that. So you uh, do manage that conflict with advisors. Maybe you could also touch on um, how that's managed from your team onto the advice group that support you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, as I think about the breakdown of the, the kind of the benefits or what, what each party in the in a chain is looking for there's if we're talking about the AFSL, there's really not a lot of other other thing that they're focused on. It, it's risk above everything else. And you can if you're sitting within an AFSL, you can see it every day. It's the provision of advice and what are those clients invested in and does it align uh with um what they should be and what, what kind of a risk profile they are. So look really for that AFSL more than it's really not about you know the ability to and margin that's that's less and less uh, across the board. It's really about management and, con and of risk. Um, but I guess as as I look at one even within our tent, it, um, scale is a really important thing uh, for AFSLs at the moment uh, and how many advisors you have underneath. So having that component um, delivery of an investment solution efficient as possible does allow a very scalable platform that you can grow on um, if you know where your risks are. Okay then you're much more confident to take the next step on perhaps allocate capital. Um, I guess as well, uh, one thing just occurred to me, if you if you have a way of investing, um, you attract the people who believe in the same, same method and same investment philosophy. So you're attracting the type of people who uh, are like-minded and, you know, they can be different across all groups. Um, for the advisor, when I see it working, um, it's really about, um, the advisor being able to achieve or doing what they wanted to do when they entered this industry is go and help people deliver really, really good advice at the right times to help those people. Um, it's either get out of get out of a position position they're in, and or you know achieve those great goals of growth of those life um, dreams of going on that holiday or you know, moving house. So. You have to be have time to have that conversation, and if you're spending time 
explaining the portfolio within a one or a two hour meeting once every year, you, you, you're not getting to the points of conversation this, where really the crux is, which is the basis of a retail or a um, discovery process is, well, what do you want to do? What, what does success mean for you? And that's where the value is um, uh, when it's done well. Um, and then for the client, um, it, it's more than, at the end of it, what I've seen is that the client just wants to know that someone is watching, someone's on top of their investments. Um, and, and and you can do that iteratively within a managed account because the transparency enables them to understand every day they can log into a Hub or Net Wealth or whatever platform you're on and see what they've got. So it's not of a case of, well, tell me what's been going on when you get to that meeting. Um, but as well, um, we go through ebbs and flows of, risk on, risk off and uh, maximum fear and maximum bullishness, it's it's nice to have um, within that managed account and having a professional in there, it's it's our job to um, have the advisor abreast of what's going on so they, they have the information to translate. So it's just sleep at night and have that trust uh, with your advisor that they are taking care of it like it's their own. Um, so as well, you you you've, you've picked on that, um, that the conflict uh, point as well, and I guess... Um, look, we we do um, build the portfolios. Um, I guess where we see uh, within the client group is where people uh, want to work with us. It's around that uh, where's the real value and it's in that transparency piece. We're not trying to be everything to all people. Um, you know, outperforming and having a well-structured product is just a ticket to the game and oh. through uh, making sure that our portfolios are externally rated by by out there and available on platform. So um, as well to the broader community. So there, there's an internal piece, but I guess the part is is that perhaps I'm just you know close by, or they can put a face to the name a couple of times a year as well. Um, and I think that counts for a lot. Um, and sometimes it's nice to have someone to yell at um, as well when things are things aren't going so well. Um, I guess. You know, if you think that's the benefit of a managed account and having someone else do it, you can you can turf them and bring someone else in, and uh, um, which is which is one we don't like to speak about much, but it's truly a benefit. It is anyway. Great example. Now, there's a good question in here, and I think Will, you're probably well um, suited to answer it. You did share an example when we caught up with Brett pre this session um, around an advice firm or someone in your tent that you're working with that had a significant amount of equities in their portfolio. So the question is, can a direct equity sleeve apply under an SMA as it would under an MDA? Um, and maybe you could share an example of, of what you're doing to support a, a, an advice business at the moment with a um, challenge around that area. Yeah. Um, well, a absolutely. It's the same principles, really. Um, the the MIS scheme or the or the governance wrapper that we put around a model, um, which is a target set of target weights that are you know structured by an investment team to deliver you know the outcomes, uh, whether they be you know uh, growth, risk, volatility, or or along those lines, are really exactly the same. Um, it's just the function of delivery. And what what governance wrap you you put around that, and each one can achieve um, has a different set of benefits. I mean, we at Climb we're currently using the an individual managed account um, when when we're treating with some high net worths, as well as the managed account uh, offer as well. And really, you can use each each is actually just the same set of pool, same set of holdings with the ability of a wrapper to give you the discretion around, so we can make the changes as when our insight changes. Um, and that's exactly the same within an MDA. Um, you know, the conversations that Brett and I have had are really around exactly the same portfolio construction. Um, it's just a case of Pat, when we when we discuss about possibilities of, of using and working with Philo, it's around um, the more bespoke approaches of being more um, selective and, and targeted around certain tilts around ESG or different products like that. Um, so yeah, I, I would. It is does get confusing a little bit sometimes, even for me, um, having uh, come across from from Fundland over and uh, managing money for some of the superannuation groups and moving into this space. 
um, they are becoming more and more interchangeable because the um, the technology advancements are moving so fast that a lot of the outcomes uh, that you've been looking from one selection and IMA, MDA, SMA, the other are available, but you've just got to work out what one's best for your business and where you're at. Great answer. Now I could ask questions for days and I'm just conscious that time is running out. So I want to make sure we get through all of the Q&A from the chat box. Um, I, one is directed from Andrew to you, Brett. He's interested to hear a little bit more um, where you mention liquid assets being managed within a managed account. Sure. So our thinking there is when an advisor is working with a client and trying to help them achieve their goals, then from an investment standpoint, you want to be thinking about managing risk and opportunity, taking into account all the assets that bear on the chance of them achieving their goal. And so they might have a portfolio of managed funds or a portfolio of shares, but you know it's not uncommon to find people who have a liquid assets and they might be a liquid for different reasons. It might be some shares because their grandmother gave them these BHP shares and they never want to sell them. It might be that it's a direct property. It might be that these are term deposits that can't be broken. It might be that it's an annuity. It might be that some kind of private market investment that is fundamentally a liquid. It could be a, it could be a property syndicate, as uh, Will hinted earlier. Um, and so how do you take those things into account when you're running your managed portfolio? And particularly if those, let's call them satellite assets for the moment, if they could be changing over time too, some mature, some get sold, some get bought. Um, so that's a that's a moving feast. And so one of the things we're doing at Philo is we're building out the algorithms so the managed account portfolio will have data on what's the, these illiquid investments, and then the managed account will rebalance having regard to these other assets. And so if you've got satellite assets that have got a you know, significant concentration in growth, for example, then you may have less growth in your MDA portfolio because what you're doing is you, the, the, the aggregate of the MDA assets and the non-MDA assets should equal the client's asset allocation target and risk profile. You can certainly do that manually and that's what advisors do today and they have their spreadsheets or they're trying to do it in X-Plan but that's not a very scalable activity. So what you see is what's happened in the industry in the last few years, people have moved dramatically up the efficiency curve by introducing managed accounts to their business. But then they say, oh, but I feel like I need to personalize it a bit more because otherwise people are getting this sort of quite homogenous experience. So they bring in some private market investments and then start sliding back down the efficiency curve again. So the question is, how can you have the best of both worlds? So introduce some of those satellite assets, but have a dynamic approach where your managed account portfolio reflects that and, and you know, adjusts accordingly. And that's something that, that we're working on now and expect to um, introduce in the first half of next year. Great, thanks Brett. Now, Will, I'll get you to comment on that as well. There was another question and it sort of somewhat aligns to, to Brett's answer, which was around multi-asset models and um, being able to effectively incorporate bonds as part of the portfolio, given that the high minimum parcel size and liquidity um, and pricing that sits around bonds, um, something that obviously your team having direct equity managed accounts and managed fund managed accounts. Um, how how do you uh, manage that within your portfolios? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the questions are somewhat related. How can you have something that doesn't, can't fit within a managed account because you have to trade daily within normal liquid markets? You'll never be able to have a full bond, you know, the minimum is $500,000 for a, for a, uh, a bond. Uh, to have within a direct holding that's a minimum parcel size. So that's really not sustainable within a managed account. Um, I think the way Brits and what they're going on about at Philo is really meaningful uh, for the ability to for, for AFSLs and advisors to have comfort that they are working with their client in that square. Um, all platforms as well are, are trying to achieve the same thing about reporting and we're seeing more and more able to hold those non-custodial custodial assets, which is really great for development. Um, but back to the question around bonds, um, you know, 
I guess at this point, um, there aren't too many ways that you can have direct exposure from bonds within a portfolio um, without without of having a significant you know fund balance, you know more exposure to five million dollars type plus. We are seeing some development. I know that Net Wealth uh, recently did a um, a collaboration uh, with an external party where they're able to fractionalise uh, the ability to do direct bonds. But at this stage, we think. Um, you know, the attractiveness that we're seeing in fixed interest at the moment, and, you know, just broad advice, no, not advice, but, uh, but we are, we are certainly have been changing our portfolios to take advantage of some of those higher interest rates. Um, but as well uh, at the moment, uh, we probably, we do do it a little bit for some of our ultra high net worth where we have discrete portfolio execution uh, at that large end, but, but at the moment we're still working towards getting them more direct um, and it's very hard to do outside of a unit trust or so. But it, as as they look more and more attractive from a risk return, I think the platforms will work uh, more actively to try and uh, move back towards fractionalising those those bond holdings. Great, thank you. Well, I'll wrap it up there. Um, I want to thank both uh, Brett and Will for the experiences and examples that they've shared today. Uh, I think the interesting part here, and one thing we didn't kind of touch on, but in a full extent, but Brett did earlier, was around how managed accounts evolve. So this is not something that's a set and forget once you uh, put a managed account within your investment philosophy, whether you've adopted uh, an institutional uh, managed account or created your own. We're definitely seeing this space evolve and will continue to evolve. And the example that Brett showed earlier was, was ESG. Uh, but definitely the experience of both these gentlemen in this space um, is something that if you have more questions, um, definitely reach out to, to either of them to, to help you gain that information and insight. But I might hand back to Toby. Thanks very much, Jamie. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Will. It, it's been a, a, a real pleasure for, for me to, to listen to today's session on the fundamentals of, of managed accounts and, of course, Jamie, thank you very much for your, for your job in hosting today's session. And then uh, we'll see you back again on Wednesday with, with uh, Centric, North and, and Quest Asset Management, talking about some of the operational issues that we touched on today in, in more detail. And then again on Friday, when we'll have Elston, Milliman and Lonsec talking about the, the investment issues and the way in which each of those three organisations addresses it. So thank you uh, to all of you who've uh, joined us today. Um, if, if you have questions, as, as Jamie said, direct them to either Brett or, or Will um, directly or send them to, to support at imat.asn.au um, and we'll make sure that, uh, that you get a personalised response. So thanks very much and we look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday and Friday. Thanks. Thank thanks, you. Everyone. Good afternoon. Jamie? Good to see you all.